about what is Old Testament theology? The answer to that is not perhaps not as obvious as you might think. The best, simplest explanation for what is Old Testament theology is Old Testament theology is the, is the study or the business that answers the question, what is the Old Testament about? Duh. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it gets at not only what is in the Old Testament, which is more of the survey class. The survey class we're doing on Monday looks at the content. What are the books? How are they organized? <laughs> what does it say? Theology deals with what does it mean? as opposed to just what it says. So when we, talk, when we say what's, the, what's Old Testament theology, it is the study, uh, the systematic study that answers the question, what is the Old Testament about? Um, one of the things that might surprise you is that Old Testament theology is a uniquely Christian discipline. The Jews do not have Old Testament theology because they don't see this as the Old Testament. This is their whole Bible. So they don't have to put Old Testament on the front of it. For them, it's just theology or biblical theology. <clears throat> Old Testament theology, as a particular discipline that looks at the, the Hebrew scriptures as different than, or in, in conjunction with, perhaps, the New Testament scripture, is a uniquely Christian discipline. And in fact, has not really existed uh, prior to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. I'm going to give you a little history shortly. It's also true we need to recognize that Old Testament theology has a number of inherent problems, and in fact, almost didn't exist. We'll get, we'll get to the, the difficulties Old Testament theology has experienced in the last 100, 150 years or so. But Old Testament theology has a number of inherent problems or basic questions, particularly on how best to approach this discipline. The first one is, do we look at the Old Testament as a vast collection, a whole library of 39 different books written by different authors at different times, telling different stories? In other words, do we look at this? It's a massive quantity of information. Two-thirds of your Bible, almost, is the Old Testament. It's a lot of stuff, and it covers a lot of time. So do we deal with it in its vastness, or do we instead try to step back and look at the Old Testament in terms of it being one compiled document, in which case the, the different books of the Bible are sort of like different chapters in a larger book, and that that one compiled document has a central motivation and a central message. These are different approaches that different theologians have taken to the Old Testament's uh, study of the Old Testament in the past. <coughs> do you, you understand the difference? You see what I'm saying there? There are questions about how do you even start to deal with something as big as what the Old Testament is. Now, to, to begin to get at that, I want to give you sort of a brief history of Old Testament theology, because the history really dictates how we do what we do when we talk about Old Testament theology. First, I, I said just a second ago that prior to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, which the Protestant Reformation started in 1517, when <clears throat> when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses, or challenges, questions, to the Catholic Church, when he nailed them on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. That was the start of the Reformation. Prior to the Reformation, the Old Testament theology pretty much didn't exist, and the reason it didn't exist, point on that, is because prior to that, scriptures were not available in common tongue. It was expected, in fact, in many cases, it was considered a sin by the Catholic Church to study the Bible, even if you could read Greek and Hebrew, because they believed it was the job of the church to tell you what was in the Bible, what it said, and what it meant. And so it was not for lay people to mess with this. So the magisterium, as it's called, magisterium is the word for the authority of the Catholic Church, the authorities from the, the Pope to the cardinals and bishops on down to the priests, that they would study the Bible, and then they would tell you what it meant, and that was good enough. And so there was not theology done in any sort of lay involvement in theology at all. Then, when the Reformation came along, you had, there were three great cries, if you will. You know, we're getting ready to celebrate the Mexican independence, where you have El Grito, the cry, where uh, Father Hidalgo cried, cried out for independence, and uh, which led to the revolution. Well, the Protestant Reformation has it, had its own gritos. Those were the three cries, sola scriptura, also sola fide and sola gratia. Sola, sola fide is faith alone, sola gratia is uh, grace alone. Sola scriptura means scripture alone. In other words, the Reformation established that 
the authority that we have for our faith and for our knowledge of God comes directly from Scripture. It is, does not have to be translated by somebody else. We rely on Scripture. The Catholic Church then and now uh, maintained that there were two sources of authority that were equal. There was Scripture, but then there was the authority of the church tradition, the interpretation of our faith as made by the church. And those two things are still held as equal today. The Protestant Reformation said, no, the church comes as a distant second. Scripture is the dominant source for us. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm not, I'm not trying to slam the Catholic Church. This is historical reality. I have Catholic brothers and sisters that love the Lord, and I look forward to celebrating with them in heaven forever and ever. So I, I do not have a problem with the Catholic Church. But historically, this was one of the things that led to the Protestant Reformation. Well, along with the, the de declaration in the Reformation of Sola Scriptura, there was a need uh, to, to do more with Scripture. We've said Scripture is our source, so we've got to focus on it more. So the, the Reformation time, that is particularly the, the 16th century, was a time of an explosion of writing of commentaries and analysis of Scripture and scholarship on Scripture, uh, probably the highlight of which was Martin Luther's translating the, the uh, Bible into uh, colloquial German. In fact, Martin Luther launched the Reformation, but perhaps the most significant thing that Martin Luther did was write the, uh, translate the Hebrew and Greek into German because in doing so he not only provided a common language version for people to read, but he also <coughs> rewrote the German language. You know, he, he settled a lot of the German language was awfully up in the air before that. He settled it into a form by writing the, by writing the Bible. So it was a huge thing that he did. So uh, a real growth in terms of commentaries, <coughs> understanding, focus on the scripture for its own sake. Then we go a century later, the 17th century, we have a period called Protestant scholasticism. Uh, there was a Catholic scholastic period quite a bit before this, but this was the time where, based upon what the reformers had said and done, you get these academic uh, Protestants come along and they develop systematic theologies. Now, systematic theology, you, will, you heard me say earlier that my, my emphasis in, in my, my academic career has been systematic and philosophical theology. Systematic theology takes all of our understanding and it systematizes it, it puts it in a system so that you can talk about things like the doctrine of God, the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of redemption, the doctrine of the incarnation. And it takes the various pieces from scripture and from our understanding of the faith and it puts it into a systematic form so you can study it and articulate it and teach it. A lot of this is oriented toward teaching. Well, this happened for Protestants in the 17th century, the Scholastics movement. Um, the beliefs and teachings that the reformers had started and developed were worked out in ways that they could be in an organized way taught to the church. Okay? Now, a big thing happened in 1787. So now we're going a, a century further. The 18th century, 1787. A man named Johann Philipp Gabler was inaugurated into a position in systematic theology at the <coughs> University of Altdorf. And by the way, systematic theology sometimes is called dogmatic theology. I don't usually use that word. That's more of an old-fashioned word because people think dogmatic sounds bad. Okay. Dogma is just a different word for doctrine. Uh, and so I, I call it systematic theology. You may read dogmatic theology. It's the same thing. Well, uh, Gabler, when he was being... Uh, during his inauguration into his position in systematic theology, in his inaugural address, he gave a, a, a lecture. And in that, he proposed for the first time that, <clears throat> that um, theology needed to be broken up into two parts, because it was all sort of one big, you know, big event prior to that. He uh, identified that biblical theology needed to be practiced separately from systematic theology. Biblical theology being a focus on, I think I've got that here, biblical theology is historical. It's a focus on what the scriptures have meant, Gabler said, to the people who first received it and in the past. What has it meant? So it's a historical approach. Systematic theology, he thought, I just told you it was primarily a way to organize things to teach, he thought that systematic theology was more doctrinal, it was more didactic, which means more teaching oriented, and so it needs to deal more with what scripture means now. Okay, that's, I've got 
Pat's head is covering that, that last word. Sorry, Pat. Uh, <laughs> why don't you all, yeah, there you go. That's, that's good. Uh, so, biblical theology, Gabler suggested, needed to be the historical view of what Scripture meant when it was first given and in the past. So it's looking backwards, passwords. Whereas systematic theology needs to be oriented toward doctrinal use now, how we teach it now, what it means now. What was meant, biblical theology, what it means now, systematic theology. Gabler's the one that proposed we divide those things up, and from that moment on, these have been dealt with as two separate disciplines. Is that clear? You understand what I'm saying there? Mm -hmm. All the way along, if you guys have questions, if something is not clear or you need, you know, you have a question about it, please raise your hand or throw your shoe or whatever you need to do. Yes, John. Uh, the, you said there were three cries in the Reformation. Right. I got two of them. I got the sola script, uh, scriptura. Or what is that? Yeah, sola fide and sola gratia. Sola fide. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Grace alone. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. Okay. So, now we've got two ways to do theology. Biblical theology and systematic theology, or doctrinal theology, or dogmatic theology. So, systematic theology pretty much continued the way it was, organizing doctrine, what we believe Scripture was teaching us, into systems that we could teach, right? But, biblical theology started off in a very different direction. Um, from that point on, biblical theology started to push harder and harder and deeper and deeper into trying to figure out what was behind and before the scriptures that we have. Again, biblical theology, remember, is historical. Whereas systematic theology is more contemporary. It's how we teach it now. Organize and teach it now. So biblical theology, being historical and looking to the past, what, what scriptures have meant, they get more and more and more and more involved in how did we get the scriptures, where did they come from, what did they mean to the people that first got them, etc. And that particularly ended up being broken down into two categories, which formed biblical criticism. Biblical criticism, the big definition. Now, I have to say this. Criticism does not mean saying something bad about. In, in, a, in academic circles, like in like in theater or anything else, you know, a film critic doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean they always say anything bad, even though they may have a reputation for saying things bad. Their job is to evaluate, okay, to just analyze and evaluate. Biblical criticism was the scholarly science or study of evaluating what we know about Scripture. It's not criticism is not a negative word in this context. Biblical criticism, the definition you have here, the scholarly study and investigation of biblical writings that seeks to make discerning judgments about those things. So biblical criticism developed as a science following Gabler's dividing up biblical and systematic theology. Biblical theology formed biblical criticism, a serious scholarly scientific study of what we have in Scripture. Now, there are two versions or two parts to biblical criticism. First, what was originally called lower criticism, and this is not an evaluation, it just simply means it's simpler. Lower criticism meant the study of the texts of Scripture. What do the words actually say? And that got into studying different, um, different manuscripts, different versions, different codexes, ancient documents, but it's actually dealing with what the thing says. Today, that's called textual criticism, or, or, or analyzing the text that we have. When the Dead Sea Scrolls came along in 1948, which we talked about in the Monday class a little bit, um, the, it was textual critics who figured out how that fit in with the Septuagint and the, what, ancient, what ancient other Hebrew documents we have and the Masoretic texts and all that sort of stuff. That's textu textual criticism, okay? which originally was called lower criticism. People don't generally have a problem with that. But then we get to the other kind of biblical criticism, which is higher criticism. Higher criticism doesn't focus on what the text says or how we got the text itself. Instead, it studies the historic origins, the dates, the authorship of the books of the Bible, um, what came before, as I said earlier, and behind the writing of Scripture. Who wrote? the book of Isaiah. All right. When did they write it? Who were they writing it to? What was the purpose? 
How has it, you know, how has it come down to us since then? Those are all higher critical forms, and higher uh, the uh, higher criticism ended up developing into all sorts of different uh, subsets. There's source criticism, form criticism, traditional history criticism, redaction criticism, canonical criticism, rhetorical criticism, narrative criticism, psychological criticism, feminist criticism, and on and on and on and on and on. Okay? Hey, I want to make a name for myself. I'm going to invent a new version of this. And if you go in it, into the Wikipedia and all those things I just read to you that I'm not going to give you the list of, um, if you look them all up, it is very hard to tell the difference in them by the definition that you read. They are very finely tuned academic stuff. Now, uh, excuse me. Yes. Question. Um, then, then you're saying uh, uh, in, in this flow chart here, lower criticism then is a subset of the biblical criticism, but it's not of, of systematic theology. It's just it's it's well, it's still systematic because those things can be systematized and taught. Sure. Sure. Okay. But, but actually, it's part of biblical theology. Systematic theology went its own way. Biblical criticism is under biblical theology. So you've got systematic theology, the systems and teaching. That what does it mean now? Right, right. You've got biblical theology. What has it meant in the past? All right, and and then that biblical criticism. So that they began to dig into the origins and authorship and dating and all of that kind of stuff. And that's where higher and lower criticism come under biblical theology. So lower criticism is 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 more focused on on the text. Yeah. It, it, that's it. That's why they now have changed the name from lower criticism. It's now called textual criticism. Looking at the text. All the stuff that I gave you all, you all who were in the Monday class, when I gave you all that stuff about the Septuagint and how old it is and where we got that and the Masoretic text and the Dead Sea Scrolls, those, that's what I did for you then. That's textual criticism. How did we get the, the words that we have that we call the Bible? That would have been higher criticism. Actually, that... that um, that would have been lower in terms of the just details. If I had gotten into what the motivation was, which I did a little bit, like the Masoretes changed some wording because they didn't like what it said, then that gets into motivation and other kinds of stuff. Okay. So I'm trying to get this. The higher criticism is more like the, the, the historical context. Correct. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Who wrote it? When did they write it? Who are they writing it to? Etc. Textual criticism or lower criticism is just, what are the words? Yeah. I don't really care where they came from. This is what we got. Okay. Is that clear? Are you all okay with that? All right. I want to spend some time now because higher criticism. What's my next slide? Here? Let me see. Um, high, I want to spend some time talking about higher criticism because it's the one that gives people problems. You're already seeing that. Um, higher criticism is valuable and it is important, but unfortunately, it has come to be associated with unbelief. Meaning it's come to be associated with people who don't really believe the Bible and are looking to try to discredit it. I want to spend some time talking about how that happened and why that happened and how that applies to the doing of biblical theology, particularly Old Testament biblical theology, today. Now, and um, when we talk about biblical theology, our focus, most of the critical work that's been done has been done on the Old Testament more than the New Testament, especially the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Old Testament. The Torah, or Law, or the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They have been victimized more than any of them. And we'll talk about that. Okay, but I want to spend some time talking to you about higher criticism. Now, um, higher criticism is, as I said, look, is historical. It looks at the various... Uh, dates and authorship and motivations and sources behind this stuff. Unfortunately, it has come to mean to so many people um, unbelief, basically. And I want to read you a quote. This is from Canon Dyson Haig. Let me flip over. I've got this. I've got my own notes of this stuff. I'm just pull it up. Read it. Um, Dyson Haig said this. There's an article actually online that you can get if you look up uh, Canon Dyson Haig, which is a very good, long article on higher criticism. He said, No study requires so devout a spirit and so exalted a faith in the supernatural as the pursuit of higher criticism. It demands the ability of a scholar combined with the simplicity of a believing child of God. But the works of the higher critic has not always been pursued in a reverent spirit nor in the spirit of scientific and Christian scholarship. The fact is that higher criticism has been done by people who 
we're not out to demonstrate God's revelation to us. In fact, quite the contrary. Oh, I can't get rid of that. Would you push the escape key? In this upper left-hand corner here. There you go. Thank you. Yes, sir. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit in terms of what, how this happened, how it affects our thinking. And I'm doing this because if you study this stuff at all, you're going to bump into it a little bit in Anderson's book. Not that he necessarily agrees with it, but this has been a huge part of the history of Old Testament theology. And we need to understand it because when you come across it, you need to know how to deal with it. All right? Um, there are three problems that have occurred with the higher critics. The first one is the leaders of the higher critical movement have based their theories largely on prior subjective conclusions that they had about the Bible, rather than on what they found in the Bible or from their research. They started out with presumptions, and I'll give you two examples of that so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, the first one is the Jesus Seminar. Now, this is not Old Testament, but these are higher critical writers um, or thinkers and theologians. Are you familiar with the Jesus Seminar? The Jesus Seminar has been meeting for like 30 years. It's a group of uh, theologians, Christian theologians, that get together and they've met on a regular basis and their purpose is to try to determine what of the New Testament Gospels, the stories of Jesus, his his the history of Jesus in the Bible, which of it is true, which of it might be true, and which of it is false. And they do this in a really strange way. They'll gather together for these symposiums, and they'll read scripture, and they'll talk about it, and they'll have different people present papers on it. And then they'll pass around a basket, and they have three stones, a black stone, a white stone, and a gray stone. If they believe this really was something Jesus said or really was an event in Jesus' life, they put in a white stone. If they think it, prob it might be, but possibly isn't, they put in a gray stone. If they don't think that it was, it was Jesus, if it's not real and not historical, they put in a black stone. They have succeeded in discounting almost all of what the scripture says about Jesus, about his life, about his teaching, about everything else. They basically have, over a period of many years, they've said none of this, we don't believe any of this is true. And these are, these are theologians, they're ministers, they're people whose profession is to study the scripture. Um, Carolyn's heard me tell the story so many times, she's sitting back there waiting for it. I was there. When she was there when it happened. There was a special that, uh, there's bugs out there, be careful. Yeah. Uh, lots of bobos. We didn't open that for that reason. The uh, Jesus Seminar, there was a special that was done by Bill Moyer about, you know, the life of Jesus. And they focused a lot on the theologians from the Jesus Seminar. And for instance, they interviewed one of the guys who's like double PhD and everything else. And he's talking, he says, well, you know, the Gospels say this. And he quoted something from Scripture about Jesus. He, and he, he, then he looks off thoughtfully and goes... But I prefer to think that it was like this. And he gave a completely different idea as to what was happening there. Please excuse my language, but I'm going to tell you exactly what my response was when he said, but I prefer to think, I'm watching this special on TV and Carolyn's there and I go, who the hell cares what you think? <laughs> excuse me? I mean, I felt very strongly about this and so I used, used that word. No documentation, no scholarship, no history, no nothing. It's just this man and the other people in the Jesus Seminar, without any scholarship behind it, come to those documents in Scripture and say, eh, I don't think so. I don't like that. That's not the way I would have done it. So therefore they say it's not true, and they teach that it's not true. Right. Just briefly, Mary and I were taking courses at uh, Concordia University, St. Paul, and we we saw a Jesus seminar and we said, oh, we passed our first test. These people obviously are not Christian. Yeah, yeah. I, they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus. They are not in any way what anybody would define as Christian. And I pray for them. <laughs> you know, I hope they feel better about themselves at some point in the future and therefore can be objective. But their pride, even hubris, their own previous presumptions come in and control their thinking. That's an example of higher critics who have allowed their previous or preconceived ideas to be imposed upon what the Bible says rather than taking what the Bible says and learning from it objectively, okay? A second example, and I use this one, John, because you asked this question the other day. This is one of the places I really disagree with Brueggemann. 
Um, the idea of the two Isaiahs. You ask that question, why do some people refer to the second Isaiah? Because we only have one book of Isaiah. The reason is because Isaiah 1 to 39 um, deals with events that are occurring during Isaiah's life, particularly the rise of the Assyrians and the threat of the Assyrians against, against the nation of Israel and all that. Starting with chapter 40 through verse, chapter 66, it changes, and it's not talking about current events, it's talking about what's to come. It's talking about the rise of Persia. Persia was not a world power then. But the second half from chapter 40 to 66 of Isaiah talks about the rise of Persia. And even chapter 45, the first verse of Isaiah, names Cyrus as the Persian king who will allow the Jews to return to their homeland. Well, the Jews hadn't even been taken in exile yet. Mm -hmm. Persia hadn't arisen yet. Cyrus was not born yet. Well, scholars look at that, and if they, if they believe that this is the Word of God, they say, well, it certainly is possible that God gave Isaiah a very specific prophetic vision of what was going to come. Scholars who were more humble would say, that could have happened, or something else might have happened. I don't know exactly how that works. I mean, that's sort of where I am. I believe God could have given a vision of that. I don't know. But scholars who come to it with the presumption that predictive prophecy, something that basically looks into the future, that, get, that can't happen. Miraculous things can't happen. God cannot provide messages of what's going to happen in the future. It can't be. They say, well, obviously this can't have been written by Isaiah. At least not the same Isaiah that wrote the first half of that book. And so they say there were two writers, at least two writers. They start with the presumption, the, the not the humility of saying, we may not understand how this works, someday we will, but they start with the presumption that miracles can happen, and so therefore there had to be a different writer, even though textual critics would say, or even biblical theologians who would, uh, the form critics would look and say there are certain expressions, particularly the Holy One of God is an expression, a name for God, is used consistently throughout both halves of that book, and only in Isaiah does it use it in that way. There are a number of other passages from the first half and the second half that are identical. The style is the same. It appears the writer is the same. The, all the other authors of the Old Testament verified, spoke of Isaiah as being the man who wrote that whole book. The New Testament writers who refer to Isaiah talk about one Isaiah in one book. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1948, they found one scroll of Isaiah. It wasn't two scrolls. Those are the most ancient documents we have. The only thing that causes the people to think there were two authors is that one idea that you can't have predictive prophecy, that God could not have done that miraculously. So you've got a whole sector of, of scholastic teachers in the body of Christ that are, that are teaching that there's two authors to Isaiah based on this based presumption. On because it couldn't Incredible. be a predictive prophecy. There's no other real documentation that suggests that. Incredible. Okay, now... So there's two examples of how they come to, high, some higher critics have come to the documentation with their own presumptions, and usually those presumptions are, and I'll talk about what those are, anti-supernatural, etc. Um, the second problem with higher criticism is the leaders, which have been predominantly German historically, have been preoccupied with theories that don't seem to make any sense. You know, that, that, that deny common sense. There is, I don't know if, you've, if you're ever in a bookstore, you don't see it a lot anymore because it's been kind of discredited. There's a thing called the Polychrome Bible. You ever heard of it? <laughs> the Polychrome Bible takes higher criticism, and one of the things we're going to look at in a minute is the, the documentary hypothesis, which we looked at briefly on Monday, which takes the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the, law, uh, the books of law, the books of Moses, and says that there were as few as four, as least four, as many as ten or more, different authors. And they have one, there are places where they take one verse and say there were four people who wrote parts of this one verse. The Polychrome Bible goes through and they color code it based upon who they think the writer was. Was it the Yahwistic writer? Was it the Eloist writer? Was it the, the Deuteron uh, uh, Deuteronomistic, Deuteronomistic writer? It's hard to say. Uh, or the priestly writer? And they color code it. And, it, and you look at it and you go, Four people wrote this 12-word verse? I don't think so. It defies common sense. And in fact, and that's not just my feeling about it, let me give you a couple quotes here. Again, Canon Dyson Haig that I mentioned earlier, and I really like his article on this stuff. He said their conclusions, meaning the higher critics, 
seem to the average mind to be curiously warped. <laughs> you hear some of this stuff and you go, really? You, that makes sense to you? Because it sure doesn't make sense to me. Matthew Arnold, I love this quote. He said, if you shut a number of men up to make study and learning the business of their lives, how many of them, from want of some discipline or another, seem to lose all balance of judgment, all common sense? The higher critics have gotten so intently focused on these theories that the stuff they come out with, you go, can you hear yourself? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so there is a lack of common sense. That's the second problem. And then... The third problem is the dominant men of the higher criticism movement have had a very strong bias against any form of the supernatural. That goes back to that Isaiah thing, that they believe it can't be a, a predictive prophecy given by God to uh, the writer of Isaiah because that sort of thing can't happen. Particularly, um, they say, first, miracles are not possible, so all miraculous narrative is suspect. Now again, remember, the reason I'm telling you about this is certainly not because I believe this, but you're going to run into this if you study theology. You're going to run into it a little bit in the book that I, that I just sold you. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Miracles are not possible, so all miraculous narrative is suspect. Second, well, predictive prophecy, that Isaiah thing, is not possible, so any such statements are invalid. It can't have been the writer of Isaiah because the rise of Persia and Cyrus came after his death. Can't be him. And thirdly, the Bible is not and could not be divinely inspired or revealed. It is entirely a human document with human origins and human problems. <coughs> These are the guys that are supposed to help us understand what the Bible is all about. Carolyn. And it was written by a committee. That's, that's and it was written by a committee. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's a camel of a document. Yeah. <laughs> we all know about committees. Yeah, we all know about committees. That's why we don't have committees in our church. We have service groups. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, another quote from Canon Dyson. In one word, the formative forces of the higher criticism movement were men who had discarded belief in God and Jesus Christ whom he had sent. The Bible, in their view, was a mere human product. It was a stage in the literary evolution of a religious people. It certainly was not given by the inspiration of God, and it is not the word of the living God. These are the people that have been responsible for helping us understand where the Bible came from. Becky. Can I see the last slide? Just for one sure. Second. There you go. So, so why have higher criticism? I mean, well, you, you haven't convinced me that this, this is good to study. <laughs> <laughs> it is valuable because um, when, I, when you sit down to, to prepare a sermon, John, or teaching, and when I do, some of the questions I ask myself, and some of the questions that we're going to we're going to talk about asking on our Friday class, how to study the Bible, is who wrote this? Who are they writing to? What was their motivation? How was it received? I mean, we ask ourselves those questions, right, in order to understand what it's all about. Those are higher criticism questions. Those are the questions, the historical background questions that higher criticism is supposed to be answering. You can, anything you do, you can either do it well or you can do it poorly. The most prominent higher critical scholars have done it poorly. The famous ones, at least. Now, that's not to say there aren't good ones. See, that's one of the mistakes. See, some people hear this and they go, well, these guys have multiple PhDs. They must know what they're talking about. No, not necessarily. Okay? There can be very smart people who have no, you know, in terms of intellectual achievement, who have no common sense about how to understand something like this. Likewise, there are some people, especially people in colleges, you know, students who go to college and they take a class on Bible for the first time, and they get taught this stuff, and they're going, well, all of the, all of the scholars, all the people who really know what they're talking about are on that side. So it must be true. That's not the case. There are very good higher critical scholars who believe that this is the divine word of God, and their goal is to understand it the best way we can, with humility, while at the same time believing that our goal is to understand more of the revelation God has given us. We're going to talk about a couple of guys who sort of were in that direction coming up here. Now, the, the book that I mentioned for the survey class that I would like to have gotten, but it was $35 and not, and not easy to get, is Old Testament Survey by David Allen Hubbard, William Sanford Lesore, and Fred Bush. They talk about the Pentateuch, 
the, we're going to talk about the documentary hypothesis in a minute, that and I want to see the underline that you have on that, because my understanding from them is they believe that the Pentateuch was predominantly, vastly predominantly, written by Moses. See, most liberal scholars completely discard that. They would say that there's no reason to believe that Moses didn't use some things that existed before, because he's writing about the, the, the prologue of history, and about, all the way back to creation. Those are stories that have been passed down long before Moses was born. And so it's not unreasonable for him to have been inspired by God to use some of those documents. Nor is it unreasonable to think that at, think that at the end of Moses' life, that Joshua, his, his assistant, the man who went on to lead the Hebrews, or someone else may have added bits and pieces to it, like the passage at the end of, of um, Deuteronomy um, that talks about Moses' death. You know, Moses might have had a vision from God and written about his own death. Or Joshua may have added a little bit on there just to simply finish the story before they went into the promised land. Neither one of those denies the divine inspiration of Scripture. It just says God can work in many different ways. It's still his work inspired for people to write. With Moses as the predominant writer of the, book of ten, uh, of the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. Okay? So, yes, Chris. What's the name of that book again? Uh, Old Testament Survey. And I can, I can show it to you on my Kindle because I, I actually have it on Kindle. But uh, again, it's so expensive. That's why we didn't. So how do you tell the difference in lower and higher criticism? Okay. Lower criticism is only concerned about what are the words, okay. what are the texts. Higher criticism deals with everything behind that. Who wrote it? When did they write it? Uh, who are they writing it to? What was their motivation for writing it? You know, et cetera, that kind of thing. All right? So do we ignore all of the higher criticism? No, you don't ignore it. You just know enough to be able to evaluate it. Okay, and that's why you have people like me who try to help, okay, who do believe this is the Word of God, and yet believe in scholarship as well. God wants us to use our minds. He made us rational creatures for a reason. He wants us to think, and to work, and to study. A lot of people just take this stuff because somebody tells it to them because they're lazy. They're not willing to think for themselves or work for themselves or study this stuff, okay? Our job is to be more disciplined about this and be able to tell the difference. That's why we have this class. And that's why I'm telling you about all of this, okay? Because you will bump into this as you go along. Now, let me mention something I talked about the other day, which is um, I'll just go to that one. the documentary hypothesis, which is the the most well known and uh, the one you're likely to run into in terms of higher criticism. The documentary hypothesis began all the way back with um, with Spinoza, Baruch Spinoza, who was a Dutch philosopher in the 1600s. Okay. Spinoza started questioning whether or not uh, Moses really wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. Called the Pentateuch, which means five books, or Torah, the Hebrew name word for law. Okay. From Spinoza, you get the British philosopher Hobbes, uh, French priest Richard Simon, more Dutchmen, more French people, more, you know, more, and then the Germans take over in the early 1800s and really make a mess of it. The person who is most associated with the documentary hypothesis is a man named Julius Wellhausen. It's sometimes even called the Wellhausen theory. Wellhausen and others from the 18th through the late 19th century, and Wellhausen, his, his largest work on this was published in 1899, so right at the end of the 19th century. They developed a theory that there were at least four, perhaps as many as ten or more different writers of the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible and that Moses didn't write any of it. In fact, Moses had been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years before any of it was written. They went so far as to figure out that there were four primary sources which they called J, E, D, and P. They did that because one of the problems they, they thought they identified in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, the first five books, was that there are different names for God in different places. Sometimes he's called Yahweh which is the Yahwist source, which they call J, and that's because this guy's, because Wellhausen and the others who really developed this in the final form were German, and the German Y is J, right? Yah, okay, Yavol, etc. So J is the Yahwist source, which they believe was from 950 BC, the kingdom of Judah. The second source they believe, because the, the word Elohim, the generic word for God or Lord is used in places, 
They was the Eloist source from the 850 BC Kingdom of Israel. Now there's no there's no evidence for this. They kind of made this up. This when and where stuff. Which is one of the reasons I'm showing it to you, is to say that they have no evidence for that. Then they thought there was a Deuteronomist source, or D, that was from 600 BC, maybe Jerusalem, and then a priestly source about 500 BC, Jewish priests in exile in Babylon. It is true that there are, in the Pentateuch there are different names for God, but let me give you a quick sense of uh, what the problems are with this, basically what their prejudices were when they started out with the documentary hypothesis. First, these guys said Moses could not have written the Pentateuch first because writing was developed much later and therefore, and, and therefore Moses couldn't write. He couldn't have written this. It had to have been written later because people didn't write back then. That has been way proven to be wrong. We have writing now that's as much as 1,800 years before Moses, we specifically have writing in Semitic languages. Hebrew is a Semitic language, along with Aramaic and a number of others. And that's a family of languages, like Germanic languages or Romance languages. They're Semitic languages. We have Semitic writing from Egypt. Remember that Moses started out in Egypt and then had the Exodus to bring these people out. We have Semitic writing in Egypt as early now as 1800 BC, 400 years before Moses' time. Not only that, but if, if Moses, as we are told, and we believe, really was the adopted grandson of the Pharaoh, you remember Moses in the basket, and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and takes him home and raises him as her own son, if he was raised in the court, and in, in the royal court of Pharaoh, he would have been one of the most educated people in the world, because that was the time when Egypt was the height of uh, education and culture and art and religion, not Christian religion course, but religion anyway. And so Moses would have been well educated and we know that there was Semitic writing long before Moses. So they were wrong about that. The second is they say the idea of the Torah, the law, or any part of the Bible being inspired and or protected by God as his revelation must be rejected outright because that suggests that there was some miraculous or supernatural um, intervention by God, that God was involved in this in a, in a supernatural way or that there are miraculous events. Well, all we can say there is, if you're right, then let's all go home. Why bother? Because everything about Judaism and Christianity and even Islam, the three great monotheistic religions that have existed and exist today, all of them are based upon the idea that God has revealed himself through inspired writings. Even Islam believes that about the Quran. We don't agree with that, but the Jews believe the Hebrew Bible was inspired by God. We as Christians agree with them about that. We believe he also inspired the New Testament. If you want to just discard any suggestion that God could have had anything to do with those writings, and all of our faith and religious belief and system and everything else is based upon that writing, then let's all go home. All right? You can't continue, and you guys don't have jobs anymore, by the way, higher critics, because there's nothing to do if you're right about that. So just by default, that it either isn't true or um, we, need to, <laughs> we need to question it. Um, and then, third, they said that the difference in the text of the Pentateuch, that is the different names for God, parallel stories, like when I mentioned the other day, Abraham lies about uh, Sarah being his wife and says his sister, I, Isaiah does the same thing with his wife, that... Parallel stories or differences in style necessarily require multiple authors. This had to be written by multiple people, not all by Moses. Well, subsequent scholarship by very qualified uh, academics with just as much, as many degrees and as much training as Wellhausen and these other guys, since then a lot more work has been done in Semitic writing styles that have shown that those kinds of variables are quite normal. The Bible is not the only ancient Semitic document we have. And there are other places where we find parallels used, where different names for God are used, where there's all sorts of similarities that we see were quite consistent. In fact, um, Canon Haig, that I quote in several places here, he comments on the fact that if somebody is a brilliant writer, whether they're inspired by God or not, then they, it's quite common they would use different words for God or for anything in different places. Uh, I, I had, 
I do a lot of writing for a living. And a couple of times I've had proofreaders for the company that I do consulting with come back and go, well, you described this, this with these words in one place in this letter and you use different words in another place. And I went, yeah, because if I used exactly the same words, it would be boring. Okay, I know what I'm doing. I don't have to use exactly the same words. You know, example, I was writing a letter and there was an event that was happening in New York City. There were places I called it New York City. Some places I called it just New York. Other places I think I said NYC. And they said, well, shouldn't this be the same all the time? I went, I, yeah, if you want to be boring. Well, some of the same sort of common sense things need to be applied to some of these things. Um, there is no necessary, scholars, more recent scholars than Wilhausen have said, there is no, necess, uh, no necessity in saying there had to be multiple sources other than Moses. Nor is there a problem with saying there might have been minor additions used. Moses could have used prior um, the oral history that existed before he was born about the, the his prehistoric prologue. He might have had Joshua or others add bits and pieces to finish out the story. That doesn't mean that it's not by Moses and it's not inspired by God. Okay? The assumptions that they made simply don't follow. Okay? That is as much as you can handle, I think, on the uh, higher criticism. Any questions about that? Ron? Well, I'm just thinking of a Lutheran professor who said the higher criticism is Elka and the lower criticism is LC. What's that? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. <clears throat> he, he was uh, just pulling out a joke. He, a professor said the higher criticism is obviously uh, liberal churches like Elka and the lower criticism is LCMS. Yeah, a Lutheran joke. Most of yes, um, I want to give you one more quote from Canon Hay. I don't think I have this up here. Uh, no. He says this, The Bible is either the Word of God or it is not. The children of Israel were the children of the only living and true God, or they were not. If their Jehovah was a mere tribal deity and their religion a human evolution, if their sacred literature was natural with mythical and pseudonymous, uh, pseudonymous admixtures, then the Bible is dethroned from its throne as the exclusive, authoritative, divinely inspired Word of God. Again, I'm telling you about all of this because this is what has dominated Old Testament theology for more than a hundred years. We've started to get away from it, and I'm going to describe that after the break. But you're going to bump into this if you read any more about this stuff. If you go online and do any research, you're going to run into JEPD. You're going to hear the documentary hypothesis. You're going to hear references to higher criticism. You need to be able to make judgments about that. So you need to have some understanding as an introduction to this. All right? We are now, let, let me see, any, any last question before we take a break? Okay, we're going to take, we're going to be, we're going to be sticking that. Uh, the, the slides in there. We need to edit this stuff together, and I can I can do another little quick segue to make that happen. So people just said, "What's the point?" I mean, Wellhausen and all these guys have said that you can't get there from here, and so they started focusing on the history of religion, okay, um, the of Old Testament religion, of Hebrew religion, instead of proper theology. The second reason um, is. General skepticism had developed in Western culture as a result of postmodernism and the postmodern loss of meaning, starting in about the 1870s. You guys know the term postmodernism. Okay. Starting in about the 1870s, they started questioning whether, whether you could even know what truth was or whether anything had any meaning. Uh, that seems fun, strange to us, but in all academic circles, in all intellectual circles, there was a general consensus starting in the late 1800s and working up into the mid-1900s that the postmodernism was defined as the sense that you couldn't really get to the bottom of anything. You couldn't really find meaning anywhere, and so why bother? So the idea of, you could still study history, you know, that's just stuff that happened. So let's do that instead of trying to figure out what anything really means, because meaning isn't available. And that led up in 1966, do you all know the term deconstructionism? Okay. Deconstructionism uh, was, was created by a man named um, Jacques Derrida. Derrida is a, a French origin. In 1966, he published a paper where he basically said, meaning is meaningless. Nothing has any meaning, nothing has any direction. This started out in philosophy, but deconstructionism took over 
literary theory and all kinds of other things, including architecture. Have you guys seen the um, Frank Gehry's, you know Frank Gehry, the guy who did the, um, the Bilbao Museum and he did the, the um, EMT Center in Seattle? There's no form to it. There's no shape to it. There's no predictability to it. It's all, it's just like in the one in Seattle, uh, it, somebody said it looked like the foil wrapping paper that they had the Eiffel, the uh, Space Needle came in. It, the influence of deconstruction, this lack of a sense of structure or meaning or reliability of our perceptions or anything else, starting in 1966, was like the, that was the next thing after postmodernism. But even by the late 1800s, this idea that you can't really know what anything means or find truth created a massive skepticism. Who, who was the guy? Derrida, D-E-R-R-I-D-A. He died in 2004. Um, and then he's got many, many heirs and assignees who have carried on that, you know, that legacy, although deconstruction itself is beginning to fail. But it, it, it infected everything. I mean, everything. Deconstruction, you know, it was this poison that got to everybody. And again, my background is philosophical and systematic theology, so deconstruction is something I spent a lot of time with, and it's very depressing. Okay? But these are the reasons why Old Testament theology almost died out. Documentary hypothesis and the historical critical method, like Wellhausen and stuff, people said, why bother? And then this general sense of skepticism, of not finding meaning, that it infected our whole culture in the West. So, what happened was, two theologians, primarily, um, these are the main ones, there are two theologians who primarily were responsible for resurrecting or reinvigorating Old Testament theology as a discipline, as a course of study. Interestingly enough, one was Swiss, who wrote in German, and the other one was German. So see, Bob, I'm not saying only bad things about Germans. Um, I had a protest from the, from the German section in the corner here. <laughs> Um, two theologians, and in fact, if you read anything, and you'll see this in the Contours book, if you have it, or in any other writing, you will find the names Eichrod and Von Rod. In fact, you, would, you almost think they're, they're Siamese twins, because Eichrod and Von Rod, Eichrod and Von Rod, they pop up everywhere, because from the middle of the 20th century on, they were it, in terms of re-establishing Old Testament theology. Let's talk about those two, because you will come across their stuff in, um, in the Contours book and other places. Walter Eichrod, um, again, was Swiss. His primary document, his book, was The Theology of the Old Testament. He started doing work in the 1930s, but this, was, this really had its effect in the 1960s. It was multi-volume. He released it over a period of seven years, from 1960 to 1967. Um, and he sort of just dismissed the fact that everybody else had decided this wasn't worth doing anymore and wrote this very significant document called Theology of the Old Testament. He had two primary concerns. Eichrode was concerned with, first of all, understanding the Old Testament in the context of the ancient Near Eastern cultures. Because the Hebrew people, the Israelite culture, was not the only one in Canaan. I mean, in, in, in what later became known as Palestine. The Near East, there were a lot of different cultures. All you've got to do is read the taking of the land, um, in, in Leviticus particularly, to, to see how many different peoples, you've read the list, Amorites and Moabites and Hittites and Jebusites and, you know, on and on and on and on. There were a lot of different cultures in that time. Each of them had their own local deities. There was a lot of cultural things going on. So I wanted to look at theology of the Old Testament in terms of how it historically fit in with the rest of Near Eastern culture. Now, that's not the same as what other people were doing because I specifically said he thought that you could be preoccupied with history. He wanted to focus on, on the Old Testament and what the Old Testament says in light of what was around it, but focus on the Old Testament. He felt like uh, his statement was that theology had been held captive by its lesser cousin, which was history. Okay, mm -hmm. Theology, queen of sciences. Um, and that theology had been held captive by history. He didn't want to go there, but he thought history was still important. So that was one thing he wanted to do as a primary concern. The second thing was, he wanted to let the Old Testament speak for itself. What does it actually say, and what is the theology that we can derive from that, particularly in terms of how that's consistent with the theology that, was, that is reflected in the New Testament? So let the Old Testament speak for itself. Don't lay all this other stuff on top of it, like, the, like Wellhausen and others have done. But 
Think of it in terms of a continuum that leads into the New Testament as well. So take it for what it's worth. Don't just, don't just, it's almost like the people, Wellhausen and others, had set aside what the Old Testament actually said in favor of what they thought was behind it. And um, Eichrod was not willing to do that. The biggest thing he contributed, the most important thing, which you will see reflected in his contours book, by the way, and be, see reflected somewhat in my lectures, is Eichrod's primary focus was to see the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, he focused on the Old Testament, but he saw both the Testaments, as being salvation history, a history of salvation that God was providing to his people, first the Israelites, and then all who would accept Jesus Christ, be they Jewish or Gentile. A salvation history, and here's a good word for you, Heilsgeschichte. German word, Bob, Heilsgeschichte. It means salvation history. Ultimately, it means God's in charge. He knows what he's doing, and he wants the best for us. He wants our salvation. He wants our redemption. When I graduated from seminary, there were several other students and I who did not, we didn't have jobs. We didn't know what we were going to do with this master of divinity we had. <laughs> and we had some buttons printed. They were red buttons, and they had the German Gothic script on them, and it said, Heilsgeschichte. And we wore those on our robes when we went through graduation, and everybody went, what? You know, salvation history. God is in charge. He knows what he's doing. He wants the best for us. Eichrod focused on that Heilsgeschichte, that salvation history, and particularly in light of the theme of covenant. A covenant is an agreement, in this case an agreement between God and people, where God says, here's what I'm going to do, here's what you need to do. This, this is my part of the commitment or covenant, this is your part of the commitment or covenant. Remember when, he, when God called Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, which we're going to talk about, God said, Pick yourself up, go where I send you, do what I tell you, and if you do that, that's your half, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will make of you a great nation. That was the Abrahamic covenant. There's two sides to it, an agreement. In fact, the, the word, we talked about this Monday, we use testament, Old Testament, New Testament. A better translation for that would be covenant. The, the original words really mean covenant or agreement. It's the... It's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, or the First Covenant and the Second Covenant, some people prefer. Um, the, so this idea of covenant, all of Eichrod's theology was written in terms of God's covenant with his people. In the Old Testament, it's the various covenants that are reflected. There was an Adamic covenant, where, where God said to, to Adam and Eve... You can have eat it from all the trees you want. You're protected. Everything is good for you. You're, you're my special people. The animals all are underneath you. They, that's my half of it. I've done that for you. You only have to do one thing. Don't eat of that tree. What do we do? There was a, there was a covenant with Noah. After, after the flood, Noah was told all of the blessings that, that he and his family would receive because they filled their side of the bargain. There was an Abrahamic covenant. There's the, the Mosaic Covenant, which is one of the biggest ones. There's the Davidic Covenant. You will notice on your outline for this class, we're going to talk about some of those. In each case, the idea was, God was saying, I care about you. I want to be in a relationship with you. I am going to take care of you. That's my part. And here's what your part is. So Covenant was the theme that Icro developed that really took off. People liked this. It made sense to them. If you look at this book, Contours, for the one, the Contours of Old Testament theology, he, uh, he takes that, that approach. Yeah. Yeah, it is based right. upon different covenant agreements. And so he takes Eichrode's approach very much. And Eichrode was probably, well, Von Rod too, but Eichrode probably in terms of structure has been the most dominant influence since the last 50 years or so. And he, along with Von Rod, were responsible for really making Old Testament theology viable again. Okay? Questions about that? You'll read about Eichrod in the book if you, as you go into it. The second uh, guy who made a difference is Gerhard von Rad, who's German. Now, both of them were wrote in German, since German is, is one of the official languages of Switzerland as well. Von Rad wrote his Old Testament theology in 1962. They were writing, at, they were contemporaries, writing at the same time. And in fact, because they were also writing articles and stuff, they interact with each other's writing. And they disagreed about a lot of stuff. But respectively, they each had a very positive influence on bringing Old Testament theology back from the brink. Particularly, Von Rod felt that Eichrod was too structural. He was still too systematic. He wanted to put everything in boxes, 
And then he made a mistake. Von Rod thought that Eichrode made a mistake in seeing one unifying theme or theology in the Old Testament, covenant in the case of Eichrode. Instead, Von Rod believed that the Old Testament needed to be seen as more dynamic and using a more historical approach, basically to see it as the ebb and flow of relationship and history and how, but that God is always working rather than being too stuck into a structure that he thought Eichrode was. He, um, Von Rod, proposed focusing on the Old Testament as history, using form criticism and the history of tradition, some of the stuff that had gotten, gotten us in trouble, but he believed in retelling the story of the Old Testament from the Hebrew perspective, which he thought looked in two directions. The, the history of traditions in the Old Testament, he thought, the Israelites have two distinct parts. The first one are the historical traditions that look backwards over Israel's experience. And he says that's especially reflected in creeds that retell this great uh, experience that the Hebrews have had. And one of them, which you may not be familiar with, is in Deuteronomy 26, um, 5 to 10. And I want to read that to you. This is um, telling the people, when the priest brings forth the fruits for a sacrifice for the people, this is what he's supposed to say. My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people, and lived there, and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. When we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression, so the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil to you, Lord, that you, Lord, have given me. That is an ancient creed, which I saw as probably the perfect example of the Israelites looking back on what their experience had been and testifying to it as a historic tradition. So the first direction that, that Von Rod, did I say Adrod, Von Rod believed that we should look at the Old Testament history is looking back as the Israelites look back. The second is looking forward, the prophetic traditions that look forward to what is going to happen, particularly, pat your heads in the way again, particularly to God's salvation plans looking all the way forward to the time of Christ. Now, salvation isn't just in Jesus. The Old Testament, redemptive, we're going to talk about the doctrine of redemption as we get into this thing. The idea of redemption goes back, again, Noah was redeemed from destruction because he and his family were righteous. The, the great redemption that the Old Testament talks about all the time is the bringing of the, of the Hebrew people out of Egypt uh, throughout the, after the Exodus, all the way through the Old Testament, it says the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who brought us up out of slavery in Egypt. The same thing that that ancient creed that I just read talks about. That theme of redemption, of salvation, was a huge issue. Both in, in the terms of the Hebrew people, the promise was God has already done part of it. He will continue to do that. He will continue to take care of us. And so looking forward all the way to the New Testament, both Icro and Von Rod believed that the, it was legitimate and appropriate, and rightly so, that the Old Testament include, Old Testament theology include a focus on how the Old Testament leads us into the New Testament, into the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. All right? Now these two guys, almost single-handedly, or quadra-handedly, however, two, two guys, um, brought Old Testament theology back. And they deserve all the credit they can get. If you read anything on this, I quote and Von Rod will pop up over and over and over again. All right? And they, they are the standard texts in Old Testament theology um, in, in classes. I had them in classes in seminary. We're not using them because they represent a specific kind of approach. I quote has his approach, Von Rod had his. We're going to look at a broader scope than that. But we're going to include some of their work as well. And they are both talked about in the contours work. Any questions about that? Okay. Yes. Does uh, Anderson kind of uh, am I am I accurate in this? Uh, he takes sides, it seems like, and he and and Von Rod 
uh, Von Rad, uh, it's kind of like maybe uh, he doesn't really embrace that uh, non-covenant yeah. type approach. Well, I think it's I think it's true that um, Anderson comes down more on Eichrod's side because that's how he organizes his own materials. He he's very respectful of Von Rod. Yeah. He gives Von Rod credit, and I don't I don't think his discussion of Von Rod either either in the early parts of the document or the book or later are dismissive. It's just they're two different approaches. And he prefers Icrodes. You know, he, he Anderson organizes his own book that way, according to the Great Covenants. All right. All right. One more thing I want to talk to you about. Uh, a third influence was the uh, Reverend Childs and the Biblical Theology Movement. And this is this also is in your book. There's a section that talks about uh, Reverend Childs or Brevard Childs and the Biblical Theology Movement. Let me tell you what that was. It started in the 1940s through to the 1960s. It really was a movement in biblical theology that was a reaction against the liberal theology of Wellhausen and others. Basically, they said, wait a minute. This doesn't do anybody any good. You can't use this stuff. You're not helping. We, uh, the biblical theology movement moved toward a, a, a sense of the Bible as having a unity, of having um, being God's revelation in history, focusing on how the Bible could be applied to our lives, that it, it was relevant to our lives. There's stuff in here that we need to know in order to be able to live from it. In fact, there was a close connection between the biblical theology movement and neo-orthodoxy. You, you, have you heard that term, neo-orthodoxy? Karl Barth is almost certainly the most important and famous uh, theologian of the 20th century. Karl Barth's effort to reinvigorate a belief in the Bible as God's revelation. In fact, Bart talked about the Bible as God's direct address to human beings. Bart was connected through his neo-orthodoxy movement to the biblical, um, the biblical theology movement. On a popular level, uh, the biblical theology movement led to a lot of Bible studies. I mean, some of you probably came from churches where it was just assumed we're going to have Bible studies. Well, that goes back to this movement, the idea that you have small group meetings and stuff was greatly influenced by this, this biblical theology movement from the, the 40s to the 60s. Um, the problem that they really ran into was, uh, let, let me give you a little more detail here. They proposed a fresh sense of the Bible's unity, a revelation of history, relevance to modern life, I said all that. They protested the liberal, sterile, and arid approaches that, that dominated um, the theologies. In other words, it wasn't useful. What you guys, you liberal theologians say, don't help us. And they agreed with Karl Barth in terms of Scripture as God's direct address to um, human beings. They tried to put aside the, the past versus present, the historical differences that existed. Remember, I started out by saying that, that um, the idea that biblical theology was concerned about what Scripture meant, systematic theology about what it means, that sort of history versus modern doctrine. They tried to get away from all of that kind of stuff and say, what is... What is the Bible is given to us now? How do we use it? How does it reveal us? The problem is, it did lead to greater, uh, is it failed. It failed in the 1960s. Huh. The biblical theology movement in terms of a movement fell apart, just like neo-orthodoxy fell apart, which is a shame. Neo-orthodoxy means the new orthodoxy. Um, and it was an effort, Bart and others, to bring back a belief in the traditional faith of, you know, of our fathers kind of stuff. It failed for two reasons, I believe. First, there was the rise in the 1960s of new theologies, like process theology. Familiar with process theology? Have you ever read the book by Rabbi Kushner, When Bad Things Happen to Good People? You heard of that or read it? That's process theology. The ba it basically says, well, you know, God, hasn't, God isn't done developing either. God isn't perfect. He hasn't finished. He's not in control of everything. He's doing the best he can. He'll get better as he goes along. That's process theology. God, just like us, is in process. That's a gross oversimplification. But the basic, the basic idea behind Kushner's book is that bad things happen to good people because, yeah, well, God's doing the best he can. Um, okay? Um, and you're going, ah, this was an international many times over bestseller? That's what that's about. Okay? So process theology and some other theologies came along sort of to build, fill the gap that had this vacuum that had existed and that biblical theology had not sufficiently filled.
uh, biblical theology movement. And the biggest reason, I think, I have here on the bottom, is that the, the biblical theology movement people wanted to have their cake and eat it too. They were not willing to completely discard the liberal theology approaches. They wanted to keep all of that. They were, they were not, they said, we believe this is the Word of God, but they didn't really believe it was the living, active Word of God. It was, well, it was inspired, but they would say that it was revealed to people, but it's not the inspired Word of God until you let it get inside and affect you. So by itself, it's not the inspired Word of God. That sounds kind of, don't expect me to explain that, because I don't know that I can. <laughs> the point is, they went halfway. They wanted to keep all the old liberal ideas, but then also have all of the good stuff, too. They wanted to have their theological cake needed, too. And they simply were not convincing at that point, and so they fell apart. Okay? Any questions about that? Next week, I promise you, we are going to start dealing with the positives of biblical theology, starting with the doctrine of God and going on to other uh, theologies or doctrines that we find in the Old Testament. Uh, we will deal with the covenant theology, and from that we will draw from micro. Uh, but I think that we can look at, my goal is to say all of the things that are foundational to our knowledge and salvation in Jesus Christ. We have to understand something about creation. I said on Monday that the two great pillars of our knowledge and understanding and relationship with God are creation and redemption. God made us, and he has a claim on our life. God redeemed us. He paid a price for us. He did it for the Israelites when he brought them out of Egypt. He did it for us when Jesus Christ died on the cross. So redemption and creation, to really understand that what Jesus did for us, we need to understand creation from the Old Testament. We need to understand the Old Testament basis for redemption. So we're going to talk about the theology of creation after the theology of God. We're going to talk about a theology of sin and the fall. We're going to talk about a theology of redemption. Uh, all of those things we get into. But I needed to give you a little history and background, particularly to let you know as you, in, you come across reading. If you read something and it, and it says, and you think, wait a minute, this doesn't sound like the Bible. This doesn't sound like what, you know, what Ross preaches or what, you know, whoever it preaches, then talk to me about it. But I needed you to know that there are massive elements in the history of biblical theology which really are not based on faith. They're based upon presumption and, and pride and bad scholarship. But they, they dominated the field for a long, long time. But we're getting it back. Okay, we're winning the day now. Because there are very good scholars around today that are doing wonderful work and saying, you know, we don't think they were right. We don't think you have to go that way. And still use your mind as well as your heart. Questions? I told you this one's going to be a tougher class. Okay, so I didn't warn you. What's your assignment? Your assignment, actually. Oh, I do have one more quote. This is a quote that I read um, in the other class, but to me this is the perfect Old Testament thing. This is from William Sanford Lesore, Fred Bush, and David Allen Hubbard. They wrote, In study, as in worship, humankind needs the entire revelation, the whole Bible. The Old Testament belongs not to the Jewish people alone, but to all. It is the account of the ways in which God has worked. It is the summary of what he has demanded. It is the record of his preparation for Christ's coming. It is the best canvas on which to catch the picture of his dealings with the human family through the centuries. In short, it is the indispensable foundation on which the New Testament is built. Could you print that out for us? Yes. In fact, what I'm going to do, start next week I will have all of these hand out all, all of the slides. I'm going to do them two on a page, and I will hand these out to you Wonderful. each week. What's that? Wonderful. Yeah, yes. okay. Uh, and I will give, right. next week I will give you this week's, and I'll give you at the start of class the ones for this next week, so you can take notes on them and stuff. Okay. Um, and we'll go from there. So it'll be easier for you to capture some of the stuff that go on. I want to make this as easy for you as I can. Uh, now, your assignment for next week. For those of you who have the book, we're doing this for degree or whatever. If you are doing this for a certificate or degree and did not get a book, I'm sorry. Please come up and see me afterwards and I'll see what I can do. Okay? Uh, homework is in, in the Anderson book. This is That's the contours of Old Testament theology. To read pages 3 to 15. Now, what I have in parentheses here, that's suggested, but it's okay if you can't slide through it. All right? Um, I would like for you definitely to read pages 3 to 15. 
39 to 47, and 56 to 73. That will catch you up on what we did this week and prepare you for next week. And I'd like for you to read pages 16 to 36 and 48 to 55. Okay? That's not that many pages. Okay? We're looking, we're looking at maybe 50 pages. For this class. For this class. I had a class in, in, my, in my THM where we read one book a week, and these are books like Hegel's History of Philosophy and Hegel's Philosophy of History, which are 800 pages. Okay, so. Were you younger then? I was. You weren't as old as we were. Well, that's why I'm only giving you about 40 pages. <laughs> but, and it's tough. You are going to read this, you're going to come across words that you don't know what they mean, you're going to come across concepts, you're going to read three paragraphs, and then you're going to go, I have no clue what I just read. <laughs> read it again, get what you can out of it, be prepared to talk about it next week, okay? I love you guys, thanks for being here, this is going to be good. Okay.